Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Today we're going to be looking at a rifle that was introduced at SHOT Show this year, the CMMG Anvil. The Anvil is a 458 SOCOM caliber rifle. Uh, this rifle here is was was built uh, based off of the 762 by 39 version of the uh, CMMG MK47 Mutant. Um, what was very special about that rifle was was they developed it as a 762 by 39 Rather than uh, taking a standard AR-15 and throwing a 760 by 39 barrel in it, using a standard carrier, putting a standard-sized AR-15 bolt in it, which has been known to break in 760 by 39 they took uh, and went with, if you, if you, I guess you want to look at an AR-15 receiver and an AR-10 lower receiver, maybe an AR-12 and a half, because they increased the dimensions uh, of the upper lower receivers up above that of a 5.56 type AR-15, but below that of a AR-10. We're going to show some comparison videos that shows the, uh, you know, exactly where this fits in between the AR-10 and the AR-15. The same thing was done with the bolt carrier group itself. Um, one of the beautiful things about this, the 762 by 39 has been very well known to break bolts because you have a much thinner, uh, you know, radius around where the chamber is, so it was more prone to break. Instead of using a 5.56 millimeter bolt, they use a 308 or an AR-10 bolt and scale it down uh, to 760 by 39 rather than scaling a 5.56 up. So you have a much stronger, much more durable bolt. We're going to talk a little bit about the ammunition. Uh, the ammunition has a very interesting uh, path, if you would. Uh, there's been four major large-bore AR caliber cartridges. All of them were developed uh, around the same 2000, you know, 2000 to 2002, 2003 time period. Uh, so we're going to go over these. I'm not necessarily going to show them in order. Um, they were all developed with a different intent in mind. So uh, the four cartridges we're going to be looking at are number one is the 50 Beowulf by Alexander Arms. We're going to be looking at the 499 uh, Leitner Weiss Rifle Company, uh, which really never went anywhere. Then we're going to look at the 458 SOCOM, and then we're going to be looking at the uh, 458 Bushmaster. The first cartridge we're going to look at in this series is the 50 caliber Beowulf. Now, from my research shows, that was the original cartridge, uh, the first one that was developed uh, in this very large bore. It was developed by Bill Alexander, Alexander Arms. Uh, it was initially developed as a hunting cartridge, uh, but it also was uh, given a military application as well. Uh, I think uh, Bill Alexander, he envisioned it more for use for uh, checkpoints who were going through glass or stopping uh, bigger engines, uh, stopping vehicles. Um, which it certainly would do, and it also proved very uh, good for hunting as well. Bigger animals, uh, alligators, uh, wild hogs, and deer and such. Um, that was really the first one. You know, with a Beowulf, you're looking at uh, a heavier bullet than you would with the other ones. Uh, you're generally looking around 300 grain bullets, about uh, 1,870 foot a second. You had quite a bit of energy on that one. Now, that one would require where it's put into a standard AR-15 rifle with a modified bolt. Uh, and... Um, I do believe that was a standard AR-type magazine, which would only would hold a single column. The next one was rather interesting, uh, the 499 Leitner Weiss Rifle Company. Now, speaking with Bill Alexander, there are some interesting uh, comparisons between these two. Um, Paul Leitner Weiss had gone to uh, visit with Mr. Alexander, and Mr. Alexander had shown him uh, the Beowulf. Now, the Beowulf did not have a lot of reliability issues whatsoever. Um, Mr. Mr. Alexander had shown Mr. Leitner Weiss several of the features of the Beowulf. Not everything, but he showed him some. And then uh, Mr. Leitner Weiss went ahead and designed his own 499 LWRCI, or LWRC, um, off of the work that uh, Mr. Alexander already had done. Well, fortunately, Mr. Alexander did not give him all the data, because the round that he had produced, uh, his intent was to answer a requirement from the Coast Guard. They wanted to be able to have a rifle that they could use that would sink small boats. That bullet was large enough where if it would strike the hull of a, of a, of a boat, you would put you'd punch a good size hole in it, and it would allow water to enter. Uh, so smaller boats, and also for uh, hitting you know, boat engines, small boat engines. So Paul Etner Weiss uh, went ahead and developed uh, his rifle. Now, rifle was interesting because he worked a little bit with Carl Lewis on there. Uh, Carl Lewis's initial, uh, his pre-production MRPs had a barrel that was chambered in the, uh, the Leitner Weiss uh, 49 cartridge. And he had also had some standard barrels made. Interestingly enough, uh, all the demonstrations that I had seen and had heard and people I had talked to 
the Mr. Lightner Weiss did a demonstration on, on a 49 LWR Lightner Weiss rifle cartridge. None of the rifles worked. You would be very uh, lucky to get two or three rounds without a malfunction. Um, during Black Rifle 2, I had put the uh, 49 LWR uh, cartridge in, uh, in, in the development in my book because of the fact that he had had an uh, interest by the Coast Guard. Um, to my knowledge from the Coast Guard and everybody I had talked to, there was never a successful fire. It was always a malfunction, and Paul would say, well, still in development. So during the testing that I did, I had also written up an article for, uh, I believe that was Special Weapons for Military and Police. I must have had at least three to four different uh, upper receivers, including the LMT. I never could get through a magazine uh, without multiple malfunctions. Trying to put it on a full auto lower receiver, I'd be lucky to get one or two rounds off before I would have failures to extract. And generally, that was always the problem. It was a failure to extract. Um, and speaking with Carl Lewis back then, Paul had had some very simple design uh, problems. In fact, Carl Lewis had tried fixing them in the past. Paul did not listen. He was very insistent on the way he wanted them done, and it didn't work. Um, I had attended a demonstration that was done out in Milan, Illinois, uh, during the process of my book. And at that time, we had a whole bunch of Coast Guard people out there. Uh, Carl Lewis was out there. Paul was out there. Uh, we had a, um, an actual uh, U.S. Coast Guard issue FN uh, M16A2 uh, three-shot burst lower. And we had all these out there, and not one rifle would go through a magazine without a malfunction. And trying to do the burst, none of them would work. It wasn't until after my book was published where everything, you know, the whole, uh, everything fell off from underneath this company uh, for as far as this cartridge, because it just never worked. Um, it was discontinued uh, after the failure of the Coast Guard, um, never working, uh, never having the reliability problems fixed. It did utilize its own magazine. Uh, it was a specific magazine for this cartridge. Um, the upper receivers uh, on several of the rifles that I had, the ejection port uh, were actually modified to accept, the, you know, they were widened at the front to accept the uh, cartridge so it would be able to uh, eject. Uh, the bullet production on that was rather interesting as well because it was used out of a uh, bimetal, uh, a copper tin alloy, and there was also a polymer type alloy that was that was mixed together. Uh, it wasn't a jacketed bullet. It was made of this material. Well, funny enough that uh, this was designed for the Coast Guard, but the type of a bullet that, uh, that Paul chose would corrode. Um, if you were if you were left it in salt uh, in salt water, the bullet would actually corrode. You would be able to see the corrosion on it. Um, it was a flat bullet, so for as far as armor piercing, it never worked because you had a flat tip on it, a slow bullet that didn't go through. Uh, he eventually would take one of these copper projectiles. Uh, and he would put a steel penetrator in it. Um, never really worked. But, uh, you know, the, the concept was, was sound. The execution was terrible. Uh, and it died a very quick and fast death. Now it's known as a Wildcat cartridge. The, uh, nobody went into production of the ammunition except for the one company that, uh, he worked with, Paul worked with for, uh, the project. And right now, uh, you may see some cartridge cases laying around, but I haven't seen any ammunition loaded in years. And this really goes back to the 2003-2004 time period when everything fell apart. But it was, was designed based off of a military requirement. The next one is the one that we're going to be spending most time on. Uh, this is the 458 SOCOM round. This particular cartridge had a requirement or, or a request uh, for information uh, from the Special Forces. Um, the way the story sort of goes is uh, during the Battle of Mogadishu, uh, there was uh, a lot of issues with the M16A2 carbines uh, that the uh, Delta guys were using and the Rangers were using. Uh, they were going right through the, uh, through the, if you want to call them skinnies or you want to just call them the uh, uh, people that were a Deeds Army, uh, and they were not stopping the targets because they were going right through. They were so small and malnourished that it wasn't, it wasn't stopping them. So they wanted to, to research uh, an op, you know an opportunity or an option to have a cartridge that was much larger. You would have much more stopping power, uh, a very heavy, uh, slow projectile. And the 458 SOCOM is what came out of that, re that request for information. Now, did it do everything that they wanted it to do? Yes, but we had issues. Uh, first and foremost, this was a very reliable cartridge. It used a standard... Um, 5.56 millimeter Stenag magazine with a modified follower. In a three round magazine, you'd get about nine rounds in it. Uh, you'd have smaller magazines as well. Uh, it would be single column. Uh, I think the biggest issue with this was recoil. 
Um, for a military uh, weapon, the recoil on it, especially as a is a is a is a combat weapon, I think is way too was way too excessive uh, for you to be able to shoot uh, as a as a as a as an assault rifle. Uh, a few rounds, 10, 15 rounds, uh, it was acceptable. But once you got above that, the the recoil was rather unacceptable, at least in my opinion. Uh, in my testing of this rifle, I've probably fired uh, 60 or 80 rounds. And i got to tell you, the recoil, um, it, it made my arm sore. And I had not tried this on full auto. And I imagine on full auto, it would be it would be pretty punishing. So for a military cartridge, I don't believe the uh, it really ever uh, materialized as that. You know, with the SOCOM round, you're looking at a you know, 250 grain bullet going about 2,150 feet a second. So you have you have some pretty good pressures on there. If I recall, it was around 30,000 psi chamber pressure with this with this projectile. Um, it was rather abusive on the uh, the AR-15 type rifle. Uh, you had a lot of uh, you had a lot of recoil on there. Um, it's true. I think it, it it truly shined up as a hunting cartridge. Worked awesome on feral hogs out here in Texas. Uh, if you were hunting uh, any kind of a medium game. Uh, animal, uh, no deer, anything that would medium game or, or lower. Uh, this was an excellent cartridge. Um, of all the cartridges that we're looking at right here, the 458 SOCOM had more options for projectiles. Uh, you had soft points, you had hollow points, you had full metal jackets, you had uh, copper plated projectiles, you had the uh, the you know the interceptor rounds as we see right here, a copper polymer matrix projectile which has an interesting shape to it. Uh, once we start into this rifle, we're going to go over some of the different types of uh, 458 cell combination that I had tested. Um, but of all the cartridges you see here, it has been the most uh, successful. The last thing we're going to show here is the 450 Bushmaster. The 450 Bushmaster was designed primarily for hunting. Uh, it never really had any applications for military or law enforcement use. You know, looking at a, a 250 grain projectile, my cheat sheet here, around 2200 foot a second. If you look at all of these, minus the Beowulf, uh, these were all pretty much within the same bullet weights, and they are within the same uh, uh, velocities. The 50 caliber, because you used a, a larger projectile, so you would have a, a heavier projectile with a little lower velocity. Um, there was a semi-spec uh, for all of these cartridges, minus the uh, Leitner Weiss. I don't believe uh, he ever had any kind of, a, you know, he never went into production. The 450 Bushmaster uh, obviously was in production by Bushmaster. So I think I do believe it still is. Um, it utilized its own magazine, uh, I do believe, and it also uh, uses standard uh, AR-type upper and lower re receiver. Uh, I've actually been waiting on uh, a barrel for use with my uh, my MGI Hydra upper receiver. I wanted to do a video on uh, the 6.5 Grendel as well as the 450 uh, Bushmaster. I'm just still waiting for that barrel. Um, the 450 Bushmaster, uh, the only two companies that I know that make ammo for it is Hornady, which was the one who uh, developed the ammunition with Bushmaster. Uh, as well as Remington, uh, and there are very few loads for it. Um, the 458 SOCOM, you have the most options. They don't come out of your Winchester Federal uh, Remington. These are all uh, other manufacturers. Primary manufacturers of the 458 SOCOM ammo I had was Black Butterfly, uh, the ARX, as well as Underwood. Underwood probably makes uh, some of the best loads for this. So as you can see, the concept uh, has been utilized a few different times, very few successfully. Um, there's no question there the success of the 50 Beowulf. Uh, the Beowulf, you only have a couple manufacturers. A lot of it comes right out of Billy Alexander himself. 458 SOCOM, several. Uh, 450 Bushmaster, only two manufacturers that I know of making the ammunition. Uh, but reloaders have uh, the ability to load all these. I'm not sure about the 49 Lightner Weiss, if there's any dies or anything that exists for it. I've never bothered researching it. Uh, the guns are very rare, uh, so it's really a non issue. I previously stated that the CMMG Mutant MK47 utilized a receiver that the size fit in between the AR-10 and the AR-15. We have a clear visual of what we of this right here. Shown here is a standard AR-10 type. Um, this is a DPMS pattern uh, upper receiver, but you can see the the length, the width, as you see here of the 7.62 AR-10 type. Up here we see the standard small uh, frame size of the uh, AR AR-15 type series. And you also have three different size bolt carriers. And we're going to show you the uh, comparison between the bolt carriers as well. But for the 7.62 by 39, this was ideal. You had much more room in the uh, area of the magazine well to make a proper mechanism to take an AK-47 type magazine. And more importantly, uh, the bolt carrier was uh, used, a, used a scale down uh, AR-10 or 308 bolt instead of scaling up 
and making a thinner, less durable uh, AR-15 type 7.62 by 39 bolt carrier. So, uh, as you can see the mutant right here, well, this is the, the anvil. Uh, you can see no forward assist, excellent, totally unnecessary. Uh, you can see uh, the lower receiver, uh, the magazines. Now, this magazine here for the 458 SOCOM anvil is a standard uh, AR-15 type magazine. The only difference is, this one particularly one's marked 458 SOCOM, is the follower. The follower is modified to accept the 458 SOCOM uh, cartridge. But uh, this fits in here, especially with the 458 SOCOM with the additional pressures in the, uh, of that cartridge. Uh, this definitely is an excellent uh, compromise in between the two. The only negative aspect of it is its proprietary CMMG. Uh, everything on the bolt carrier, everything on the upper and lower receiver, um, for as far as the receivers themselves. Now, of course, we have the trigger mechanism. That's standard AR-15, pistol grip standard AR-15, uh, selector. Uh, the, the pins themselves are standard AR-15, but the upper receiver and lower receiver and the uh, charging handle are proprietary to uh, CMMG. Next thing we're going to take a look at is the bolt carriers themselves, so you can see the difference between uh, all three sizes. Okay. Shown here are the, the bolt carriers. Starting here, we're going to have a standard uh, AR-15 M16 type. Down here, we're going to have a standard AR-10 type, and right in the middle here, we have the... Uh, well, either the, either the mutant or the anvil. Uh, this particular one is the anvil. Notice the differences in lengths. This one here in length sits right in between. So stronger, more weight, more mass. Uh, designed very much more so for these larger calibers. The most important thing we're going to look at now is the bolts. Okay, shown here is, a, is an actual production 7.62 by 39 millimeter uh, bolt manufactured for a AR-15 M16 type conversion. Now you can see how thin these walls are right here. Uh, you don't have a lot of support on the sides at all. Next we have the anvil. Uh, this is a slightly different uh, diameter, but you can still see this is a 5.56 millimeter base bolt scaled up to take the 7.62 by 39 cartridge case. Here we have a AR-10, as you can see, or a 308 style bolt. It is scaled down for it to accept the, uh, in this case, the 458 SOCOM or the 7.62 by 39. So look at differences in the material and how this sits right in the middle. You have much more material, a much stronger bolt um, than you do on the uh, AR-15. Again, these have had uh, issues with breakings because of how thin these, these sidewalls are here. You can see the locking lug size on the, on the standard AR-15 type versus the locking uh, lug size on the 308 and the, uh, the the CMMG. You have much stronger uh, locking lugs. This has been an excellent uh, enhancement to take these larger calibers. We're going to take a close look at the uh, 458 SOCOM CMMG uh, anvil uh, bolt carrier group. Um, everything you see from front to rear, all proprietary to CMMG. Uh, there is no components, I think, other than the, possibly the carrier key. I'm not sure or not, but that could be proprietary as well. Uh, we're going to take it apart and we're going to show some of the uh, components that are inside of it. Don't have one for comparison, but even the uh, frame pin retaining pin, I don't believe is, is the same as the uh, this, the AR-10 or the uh, 5.56 AR-15s, but uh, I don't have one in comparison, so we'll let that one go. Firing pin, completely proprietary. This may or may not be the same one that they use on their 762 by 39 but this is proprietary. Uh, very well-built, strong uh, firing pin. Get that cam pin out. And shown as the bolt. Uh, very, again, very strong. Uh, this uses a McFarlane gas ring, a one-piece gas ring. Very well built, very strong, very proprietary. Uh, the face of the bolt is actually marked 458 on the locking lug, so you know this is a 458 SOCOM as opposed to a 762 by 39 millimeter a bolt. Now, I'm definitely not dogging uh, proprietary guns like this. Uh, not at all. The only thing that I would recommend is anytime you buy a proprietary gun that you keep on hand, uh, I'll pick up a spare bolt, a uh, spare firing pin, spare cam pin, and a couple extra of the firing pin retaining pins. I think you just want to take a look at the parts that you think can wear or can uh, or can break, 
and just have those on hand. Um, for you know, that's the only thing that I would say about going proprietary. Uh, just have those specific parts that you know you're not going to have a you have a hard time replacing. Uh, keep them in your your shooting box. You know, as per mill spec, we have an excellent uh, chrome plated uh, inside of the carrier key as well as the inside of the uh, the carrier. Um, Again, very well made, very well manufactured, no machining marks. Put that back together like any other uh, type rifle. There's also a state of the charging handle. The charging handle itself is proprietary. Um, however, you would be able to change out your uh, your latches. Say you want to go with a, a you know easier to use latch or a larger latch, you could take any commercial latch and uh, pop that spring out and replace that. So the charging handle is not interchangeable, but the latch is. The receiver, you can clearly see the additional material that's in there. Now, if you were to compare this to the MK47, you don't have as much material in here. Uh, the MK-47 does not have the bolt catch mechanism uh, due to the fact that the AK magazines don't permit that. But, of course, you have uh, an AR-15 type magazine, so you do have a bolt catch. But you can see uh, much more material in there. The trigger that came on the anvil here was uh, a standard mill spec trigger. Now, you could put any kind of trigger that you would want in here. You wanted a two-stage or you wanted something else. You would have no problem. That would just drop right back in. Um, because you have a lot of material, you have a very beveled uh, magazine well. I mean, you'd, even a blind person could insert this in, in the uh, magazine in during the uh, night hours, no problem whatsoever. Uh, the buffer uh, is a standard uh, MK47 uh, mutant. It's a buffer that's particularly tuned towards the uh, 7.62x39 cartridge. You have a mil spec uh, stock. This one came with a CTR stock, Magpul. You also have a Magpul mil pistol grip, one of my, one of my favorites. This is a billet receiver. Uh, so, that's manufactured from a billet of 7075 T6 aircraft grade aluminum. The trigger guard is uh, part of the uh, lower receiver. Uh, other than that, any maintenance you would do on this receiver is the same as you would on any other uh, AR-15 or AR-10 rifle. I didn't find the trigger to be uh, too far out of whack for as far as accuracy. It shot quite well. Uh, um, I, I was happy with it. I'm also not somebody who tends to put a lot of aftermarket triggers in uh, my rifles. I tend, tend to leave them the way that they are. This rifle is set up, this is a hunting rifle. This is something, you know, you're going to go out here in Texas, you're going to go kill some pigs with. This trigger is perfectly acceptable for uh, any kind of uh, hunting that you would do with it. It's not a bench rifle for shooting uh, match-grade accuracy. That's not what its intent was. Looking at the upper receiver, um, these larger particular rifles do not have the same kind of a barrel extension to feed ramps. Uh, you have the whole bottom, which you may be able to see, hopefully you will be able to, is left open so it will accept the uh, larger cartridge. You can see how this is uh, the feed ramp. The feed ramp. It's not feed ramps. It's feed ramp uh, for the cartridge that's coming from a single column. Uh, locks in place there. Um, everything else is similar to this, your standard AR-10 or AR-15. Looking at the receiver, we also have a fire cartridge case deflector and no forward assist. Makes me happy. I'm very happy to see there's no forward assist because I don't uh, believe that it's necessary to begin with. We have a 15-inch free-floating rail, uh, which is key mod. You know, I get a lot of questions on key mod versus M-Lock and whatnot. I don't know what I feel about it. You know, personally, I like 1913 rails, um, but everybody's going to the lighter rails with the detachable rail segments. Uh, my opinion between the two, uh, M-Lock and, and key mod, I don't think it makes any difference. I think it's two different ways to get to the same place. Um, they have similar ways that they work. Uh, one's a mag pull design. Uh, one's not. Uh, so I think whatever you like. The popularity these days seems to be going more towards M-Lock. Now, given the fact that uh, Magpul was the creator of the M-Lock, Magpul is really a trendsetter in this industry. Uh, generally, what they come out with is immediately accepted uh, and it becomes becomes Bible. So uh, I think in the industry, uh, the, the trends tend to be going more towards uh, M-Lock. But uh, either way, I think it's uh, I think you're fine either way. You know, I have rifles here. Most of my rifles that I build are going to have the standard 1913 rails. And the reason I do that is the rifles I build, I do more as military-type rifles, and uh, in my opinion and in my experience, uh, it's not a good idea to send a military rifle out with rail segments because they're going to lose them, they're going to have to keep those on hand, uh, something that's going to get lost when they're going to need them, they're not going to have them, 
where if you have uh, your standard quad 1913 rails, it's always there. So if you have uh, something you got to add or take off at any time, the rail is there. Unused rail, use yourself a nice Mansa rail cover or something to cover that up. Um, for commercial use and for law enforcement use where uh, you're out in that same situation, you know, go with anything, whatever, whatever you like. I do believe military use were far better off staying with the standard 1913 rails. I'm going to reassemble this rifle. The scope that I chose on here was a Bushnell AR optic. Um, this is a standard 1 to 4 power. Now, uh, for the range of this, this is pretty much a 100 yard gun. You're not going to go much beyond that uh, effectively. So I felt this was a, a decent optic. Um, it's not a very expensive optic. It's for somebody who's looking to get an optic that's not too expensive, uh, but will do the job. Um, this optic uh, does that. You know, a lot of these Bushnell optics um, I've been using a little bit. Uh, you know, these are only a couple hundred bucks, but for these uh, shorter range platforms, I think they're excellent. We're going to take a little bit of a closer look at some of the ammunition that I've been playing with. Now, uh, shown are the projectiles that uh, are the types of ammunition that I use during this article for testing. Uh, fortunately, CMMG, uh, who, who loaned me the rifle for the evaluation, uh, I did not have any 458 SOCOM ammunition at all in my uh, inventory here that I use for testing. This is, in fact, the first 458 SOCOM that I have ever tested. Um, this one here, I was able to test fire at SHOT Show at Media Day, so I got to shoot it once before. But we're seeing a standard full metal jacket flat point. Uh, we're also seeing one of the 300 rain extreme P's. Uh, this type of projectile has become very popular uh, for uh, pistols as well as rifles uh, due to the way that it has terminal performance. We have a lighter uh, copper polymer uh, matrix projectile. Um, you know, these work very well for target practice. Uh, and this is a good hunting round. This is a good uh, target shooting round. And for what this is, even this uh, full metal jacket on a, on a pig or something will do a good job, but you always want to have some kind of a projectile that will expand. And we also have a ballistic tip uh, here as well. All of these uh, function feed no problem whatsoever uh, you know, in the rifle that we had. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take the CMMG anvil out to the range and we're going to see how it shoots. CMMG anvil. It's a wicked pig cartridge. Let's go look at this target. Ten rounds. Due to the black rifle becoming this country, which is this country's most popular rifle, um, is utilized for many, many different uh, types of jobs. Uh, the hunting, the military, law enforcement, target shooting, um, it, it's able to breach every single one of these uh, different types of uses. The 458 SOCOM, the 50 caliber Bay Wolf, uh, the 450 Bushmaster, those have a, a definite place in the industry uh, for hunting. 
if you look at uh, you know us down here in southeast Texas and other areas throughout the the south where we have major problems with feral hogs, uh, there's a lot of animals need to be disposed of. Uh, the 458 SOCOM does an excellent job on all of those uh, animals, uh, all those uses. Uh, for a law enforcement aspect, I've never seen them being used, but could they be used? Yes. In regards to some of these really large caliber versions of the rifle, I will say one of the interesting things I did see uh, during one of the Coast Guard demonstrations with uh, the Leitner Weiss 499 Leitner Weiss uh, rifle, I saw the only time I think I ever saw a three-shot burst actually work. Hit an outboard engine on the back of a boat that they had out at the range, and those three shots knocked that right off the back of the boat. Of the boat. Uh, it, was, it was wild just watching that thing, uh, that whole heavy engine just come right off of that uh, the back of the boat. So that was really interesting. So there is a there is a law enforcement or a, even a maritime type a law enforcement application for it. Uh, whether it's used for it or not, I've, I've yet to see, but the, the possibility is there. But I really view this as a, as a good hunting cartridge for um, any kind of a medium game animal in Northern America. I do thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, please share. Thank you.